Always. We ask the question. What is needed in the world? Is that going to be? The small Pacific Island nations of Papua New Guinea and Nauru host what some call Australia's offshore prisons for refugees. They are home to around 1,500 asylum seekers who were taken into custody after entering Australian waters without visas. Many of them have been stuck living in limbo for more than three years. Both prisons are run under secrecy, off limits to media and to NGOs like Amnesty International. So what's going on inside? Are these prisons Australia's Guantanamo Bay or a necessary deterrent helping to save refugees' lives and allow Australia to run a generous program of orderly refugee resettlement? This week, Australia's Immigration Minister Peter Dutton talks to Al Jazeera. Minister, thanks very much for talking to Al Jazeera. Pleasure, Andrew. Thank you. Human Rights Watch has called Australia's approach to asylum seekers abusive. Amnesty International has said that parts of the asylum seeker regime that Australia has are inhumane. Last year, countries queued up to express concern at the United Nations Forum about what Australia was doing when it came to refugees and asylum seekers. Are they all wrong? Well, Australia needs to do a better job of explaining exactly the amount of assistance that we're providing. Uh, as a first world country, we are, along with the United States and Canada, the most generous provider of places under the Refugee and Humanitarian Program in the world. Now, there are many countries that don't provide any places at all. And for us, we want to make sure that we can have an orderly migration program. So we provide uh, millions, hundreds of millions of dollars each year of assistance uh, to people to help them uh, either in Indonesia, for example, uh, in regional processing centres, uh, domestically onshore, uh, until such time as they can establish their claim as a refugee or if they've been found not to be refugees, to return back home. Now, with you're right. With respect, you're talking about the UNHCR resettlement program, and on that Australia does offer places. But when it comes to people making their way independently to Australia by boat, none of them are allowed to stay. And what you do to those people is what Amnesty, Human Rights Watch and other countries are concerned about. Well, again, I think people are best to concentrate not on the emotion, but on the facts of what we're dealing with. So, uh, for example, uh, we had uh, 50,000 people arrive on 800 boats uh, under the previous government and 1,200 people drowned at sea, 1,200 that we know of. Uh, since the commencement of Operation Sovereign Borders, we've been able to provide a humane environment uh, for people to uh, settle in regional processing centres, obviously conducted by, uh, in the Nauruan case, the Nauruan government, uh, in PNG, uh, by the PNG government. We provide assistance to those processes. But at the same time, the dividend of the success of stopping boats and most importantly stopping drownings at sea is that we've been able to offer a record number of, of places under the humanitarian refugee program. But with respect, you're not necessarily saving lives. You may be saving lives in the Indian Ocean on the routes coming to Australia, but people are still making desperate journeys. They are still travelling far wide around the world, and they're dying in the Bay of Bengal, in the Mediterranean, under lorries between Calais and the UK. They are still dying. They're just not dying in Australia's backyard. Well, it's hard for Australia, of course, to take responsibility for what's happening in the Mediterranean. But you're just or... pushing the problem elsewhere. Well, we're, we're dealing with the problem on a regional basis, and the thought that Australia can resolve uh, issues that have been around for uh, decades, for hundreds of years, in terms of uh, irregular movements of people across borders uh, is a nonsense. So, from our perspective, we need to work with uh, our near neighbours, including Indonesia. Uh, people, you're right, have flown thousands of kilometres uh, from the Middle East, in some cases, to hop onto boats out of uh, Indonesia or out of Sri Lanka, for example. And uh, we don't want that to be the case. We don't want people travelling that, uh, those long distances. And as I say, Australia, along with Canada and the United States, we rank in the top three countries in the world in terms of the number of places that we provide to people seeking refuge. And, and if but we those don't, numbers it, are still 18,000 you're building up to in a few years' time or just over. Those numbers are still pretty tiny. There are a million to, refugees but compared currently to, compared in Lebanon, two million in Turkey. When you say that they're relatively small, I mean, who do you compare us to? I'm comparing you to other countries that well, have a lot as. more refugees. Turkey, Lebanon, no, the number well, that are, are settled within the UK or, or Canada. You, you but, but, again, an but again, Andrew, I mean, you, you need to deal with the facts here and not the emotion. We're talking about people who are settled on a permanent basis. That's the Australian program. So people who are moving into Turkey or Lebanon, for example, are moving into Zatry, those people are not there on a permanent basis. Now, as the UN rightly points out, there are 65 million people who are forcibly displaced. There are 6.5 million people just in Syria alone. Now, the thought that uh, even if 
Australia increased our figures from, as you say, 18,000, which makes us a top, uh, among the top three in the world. If we increase that to 180,000, uh, there are still many countries across the world who are taking no people on a permanent basis. And Australia is certainly taking very many more than the countries that you point to on a permanent basis. And but it's not UN, as if Australia doesn't have either the that. space nor the wealth. People look at Australia, this vast continent of a country, and wonder why Australia can't be more generous in what is commonly accepted as one of the worst refugee crises that the world has ever seen. This is a big, big country. There is space and there is money to resettle more. Well, well there is in Europe too, and there is in the Middle East as well, and countries there, sovereign nations make decisions about who comes to their country and the support that they provide. I can't speak for them. I can't explain to you why some countries take a decision to make uh, no people uh, settle permanently or allow no people to settle permanently in their country. I mean, that, that's an issue for uh, others to talk about. But in terms of Australia's position, we are one of the most generous benefactors in the world. We are the biggest uh, provider of aid to refugees in Indonesia. We don't want to see women and children drowning at sea. We don't want to see a, a disorderly program. And so we've taken a decision that we will take record numbers. Uh, in addition to the 18,750 that you point out, we're taking 12,000 Syrians. Now, again, that puts us close to the top of the list, and there's no country that you can point to that is doing more than Australia, outside, potentially, uh, of the United States and Canada. And on a per capita basis, can I, Australia can I, is a world leader. Can I turn to Operation Sovereign Borders, as, as you call it? The turning back of boats at Where sea, it's safe which, to is, do so. which is which is going on. Last year, Al Jazeera filmed banknotes, US dollar banknotes, that the captain of a people smuggling boat in Indonesia told us and told the Indonesian police Australian officials had given him at sea to turn back his boat. Isn't that Australia bribing people smugglers? Isn't that in fact Australia commissioning its own people smuggling operation? Well, Andrew, I'm aware of the media reports and as I said at the time, I wouldn't make any public comment in relation to it, and I wouldn't now, but the point, the point that I would it's, make... It's more the media reports, though. I mean, that, that, the crew of that boat are now in prison, and the judge at that trial said during the trial it has been established that money was given by Australian customs officials to you. Therefore, you made a profit. Therefore, you're going to prison. Well, as I say, I'm, I'm just not making any comment in relation to uh, some of the media speculation. The point that I would make is uh, that under Operation Sovereign Borders, we have stopped drownings at sea and we have been able to bring in, in your region. people in record numbers. And I think that's something that Australia should be proud of. And I think the rest of the world should be aware of because we provide, as I say, to a country like Indonesia, uh, the largest amount of money to provide support uh, to their refugee population there. We've su supplied uh, over $200 million uh, to the Syrian crisis uh, since 2011. We're committed to another uh, quarter of a billion dollars over the next few years. So we provide significant support to, uh, both financially and in terms of the number of places that we, uh, that we settled. This time last year, I was in Paris uh, with the High Commissioner uh, from the UN and he said in that meeting that Canada, along with Australia, provided uh, the best settlement arrangements for people uh, under the Refugee and Humanitarian Program. And again, I think that's something that Australia is very proud of. But let's talk again about those people who, try, who have tried to make their way to Australia. When they don't reach Christmas Island, Australian soil, or when they do and they're brought by your officials to the island, they are or were very quickly deported to either Papua New Guinea or to Nauru into what you call regional processing centres. They are really, though, prisons, aren't they? You've locked people up. Or, I know they're more open now, but certainly for the majority of the time that those 2,000 or so people have been held, they're in prison-like conditions and pretty bad conditions as well, all at Australia's behest. No, the, the point that you're, you're trying to make is that people want to come to Australia. Now, under the Convention, uh, and the protocol, uh, the arrangement is for people that uh, make a case uh, for persecution or claim to have been persecuted or are fleeing a particular situation, uh, they can't, uh, having sought refuge in a country like PNG, for example, or Nauru, then take a decision uh, that they want to come to Australia or Canada Sorry, or New they, Zealand they, they or tried to wherever it might be. Refuge in Australia. Sure, but their, their claim was that they were being persecuted, if that's the claim they're making. Their claim is that they're being persecuted and they're fleeing a particular homeland or country, wherever it may be. Now, under the, under the convention, people can't shop around for the country that they want to go to. People do want to come to Australia. Millions, tens of millions of people would come to Australia tomorrow because we're a very generous nation. We provide significant support. And as the UN points out, in terms of the support we provide to refugees, 
when they arrive in Australia, along with Canada, we do it the best in the world. So but Canada doesn't send people to another country to protest their claims there. These are people who have sought refuge in Australia, and you've said, bad luck, you're going to Nauru or Papua New Guinea. We've said and you're living in pretty horrific conditions in the meantime. We've, well, well, again, I, I dispute that, but uh, the, the point that I would make is that we bring people in uh, in record numbers, uh, but we do it by, by air, and we provide all sorts of assistance around English language training, around cultural integration, education, housing, well, with, with all respect, of that. that. That again is, is refugees you're resettling through the UNHCR program and they're, they're in, not those that I'm talking about And as you, as you point out, I mean, we do that in record numbers almost more than any other country in the world. So that, that is the dividend of having a controlled migration program. You see, there's uh, many studies that have been done. The Scanlon Foundation here, for example, uh, which is a very credible longitude uh, look at uh, the way in which uh, Australians support the migration program. Australians support uh, record numbers of people coming through the uh, migration program and the humanitarian program when governments have proper control of the process. I don't want to give up our process uh, and the right to decide who comes to our country to people smugglers because, as you rightly point out, Andrew, the people smugglers, having taken the money from in innocent men, women and children, couldn't care less whether those people make land somewhere or whether they go to the bottom of the ocean and this government's not going to be a party to that. Those that you do send to Manus Island in Papua New Guinea or to Nauru, particularly Nauru, there have been a number, well both places, but Nauru specifically here, there have been reports about the abuse that has been alleged by asylum seekers, refugees in that prison. The MOSS report, the Australian Parliament's own report, said that the abuse was probably being underreported. The Amnesty report has said similar things. The 2,000 files from Nauru, written up by staff there, of allegations made, and some are minor, but some are quite serious, include sexual assault, include self-harm, include allegations that people would be given longer showers by guards if the guards could watch them showering. These are children. These are pretty bad things. Do you feel confident that these have properly been investigated? Because you have been quite dismissive of such things in the past. No, I've made the point that uh, one allegation uh, is uh, one too many, and none of us would ever tolerate. And it's more uh, than 2,000 that we well, know of, and probably but, more since but, then. But, but again, I mean, you, you're contradicting the previous point that you made, because of the 2,107 that you refer to, uh, which spanned the period from 2013 or so, uh, the reality was that, uh, yes, we'd inherited a big mess where people had been put onto the regional processing centres uh, in great number and we have uh, not seen any arrivals in over two years, so we're not adding to that number and we're helping people to return. Uh, but this is the important point that you make in the earlier statement. That is that uh, there are many of those instances, for example, where uh, a mother has disciplined her child, that makes up one of the 2,000 uh, reports. So a child who goes to the beach uh, and has touched a sea urchin uh, and has a rash as a result, that is included amongst. Now, as, as I point out to you... Uh, the but not one, one, as far as we know, well, just, there has just, not just, been one conviction in relation to any of those allegations. Not one. And with the best will in the world, if, even if you're saying a number are minor, maybe many are, they're not all incredibly minor, they can't all be made up. And the fact that the Nauruan authorities have not investigated any enough to come up with any convictions, and frankly, there doesn't seem to be much of a process of investigation either from those we have spoken to who have worked in those centres. They say the allegations are made and then forgotten about. Well, well again, Andrew, all, all I would say is that we're better off to stick to the facts as opposed to the emotion. And many people in this space are very emotional because they don't want uh, any other outcome other than coming to Australia. And we've been very clear that if people seek to come illegally by boat, they won't be settled in Australia. And that's the, that's the continuing position of this government. And there are lots of people, as you say, and you quote some of them, uh, and you've spoken to many of them, uh, who don't ever agree and will never agree with that policy. But that policy is not going to change. We'll bring people in the refugee and humanitarian program through the right way. We will provide support to Nauru to investigate any matters. And you're right, I mean, there are some claims that have been made where people have withdrawn complaints, where they haven't been able to substantiate or even provide a description uh, of the but individual. But often the complaints are against the very guards. No, they're not. No, they're not. So uh, please detail those to me. We've had, uh, well, an allegation that a guard... An allegation, yes. Uh, these are all allegations, yes. I accept that, but I don't... What I'm failing to see is any proper investigation into these allegations, well, and certainly not one that's resulted well, again, in a conviction. If, again, if we could stick with the facts, a, that I, there I, are. You asked for one about a guard. A, a guard who saw, a guard who threatened to kill a to kill a boy, 
Allegation, admittedly, but that's a guard threatening to kill a boy. Another guard who laughed at a child who'd sewn her lips together, an act of self-harm, and he laughed at her, is the allegation. All, all unacceptable if, if they're true. If they're true. But now, how do we know if they're true? Because well, this is happening out of sight as far as Australians are concerned, the people paying for this prison, this centre. Well, well, well again, I, I, I just dispute uh, some of the uh, emotion involved in the, uh, in the allegations and, and in the questions. I, I think if we stick to the facts, there are allegations that are made on some of those uh, uh, occasions, people have withdrawn or they haven't been able to provide sufficient evidence for prosecutions to commence. Uh, and in other cases, uh, they have been a full investigation and they haven't substantiated a charge against an individual. Now, there are allegations against people within the centre having assaulted uh, other uh, detainees within the centre. Uh, that, that's the vast majority of uh, the uh, like allegations that you're talking about. But if the, the headline of 2100 is said in some way to uh, to exaggerate the situation. As I say, the vast majority of those are uh, instance, instances where there's been a discipline of a child by the mother or by the father, where there may have been a domestic dispute between the husband and wife uh, within the facility. Now, bearing in mind that on Nauru and on Manus, nobody is held uh, in detention. There is an open centre arrangement. People are provided with three meals a day. We've spent $26 million on the hospital in Nauru, $11 million uh, on the medical centre. Children are picked up on the bus each day to go to uh, the school. Well, to Nauru is 19 square kilometres, Manus Island, I've been there. The, yes. uh, I, I realised since April that the facility has become slightly more open, but it's very remote from any town. It's not as if people can come and go easily. It's a no, long way away. That, and, it, and that building has high wires, it has high fences, it has borders and guards, regular guards. This is. This is like a prison, even if you call it an open facility. So there are hundreds of people that have decided to go back to their country of origin because they've been found not to be owed uh, protection. They have been found not to be refugees and understandably they want a better life for themselves. They want to come to a country like Australia and start a new life. Nobody can begrudge that. But as we pointed out before, there are 65 million people across the world that would seek to do that. So Australia and many other countries, as we're seeing in Europe, must have an orderly migration program because if we don't, we see the consequences of the young boy washing up uh, on the shores of the Mediterranean, horrendous. And similarly with the 1,200 people that drowned here, and we are not going to allow that to happen in our region. So we will work to provide support to the regional processing centres. People should be treated humanely, and they are. People should be treated with dignity, and they are. Is it humane, though, are. to keep people locked up in limbo for more than three years well, in some cases? Well, let, because the mental anguish that they are going through is pretty horrific. But, Andrew, let, let me ask you the question. I mean, if you've got somebody who's been found not to be owed protection, not to be a refugee, and we've offered them support, a package to go back home and to re-establish their that lives. That's the minority of people. If we don't allow uh, those people uh, to accept the package and uh, stay and come to Australia, there will, of course, be other people that follow. Now, let's I mean, talk you about are the refugees. Well, let's, 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 as refugees, they were fleeing uh, persecution. Yes. By definition, uh, people are fleeing persecution in many cases. Uh, they found refuge in countries uh, such as Nauru and such as PNG that are signatories to the convention. But ultimately, they want to come to Australia because we have a very generous education system, health system, welfare system, the best in the world. Now, in the meantime, though, are you worried about children on antipsychotic drugs because they've been there for so long? One of the workers, one of the teachers we spoke to on Nauru, Evan Davis, he told us that he was advised that he wasn't allowed to spend, as a worker, more than four weeks working on Nauru because it wouldn't be good for his mental health. Now, that is a worker there who knows he can come back to Australia whenever he wants. If it's bad for the mental health of a worker in four weeks, then what can it be like for children who are there for three years plus? Obviously, there is a rotation system for people to come in and out. People fly in, fly out in terms of medical workers or uh, staff on the island. I mean, that, that would be a normal practice for uh, any company to fly their staff in and out. Now, well, he was told specifically it was about the, his mental well-being. Well, if he's dealing with difficult situations and people are pleading their case each day to him or to others, you can understand why that would be difficult because uh, I don't want to see children uh, anywhere but in a loving home. I don't want and, to see... Well, and well, children just, well, referred just, to by numbers, not by names. Well, by just, three letters and then numbers. Just, that just, doesn't sound like a very... It's a dehumanising thing. Well, just, just let me finish because, I, I mean, in terms of the support that we provide, some of the classrooms on Nauru, for example, uh, I've been into some of the classrooms where uh, there are electronic whiteboards, overhead projectors, uh, small class sizes. Uh, we contract Australian education providers to deliver curriculum and programs uh, to those children it, to a very high standard. Uh, we provide, as I said before, support through medical assistance. We provide support through 
uh, language training, we provide significant support. To, it's, it's interesting to point out that you haven't noted that uh, there are over 350 people on Nauru who are employed uh, in local, uh, uh, local businesses or employed uh, uh, in jobs. Now there are 35, for example, who have started their own businesses there, and there are many hundreds. Why can't we see any of this? Why is the and media there... banned from going to Nauru and effectively from Manus Island as well? Well, there was uh, uh, Channel 9, we're up on Nauru recently, uh, the Australian we, we have been received, up there recently. We, we have been trying, as Al Jazeera and other media organisations have tried for three years pretty consistently. We received an email a few months ago now saying all media application I, I, I quote, is being denied. All media applications is being denied. A, a hand-picked program was allowed very restricted access to Nauru. One single journalist from a newspaper has been allowed in as well. well These it, don't, it doesn't feel like an open centre. Amnesty have not been allowed to go but, to but, but Nauru. But again, again Andrew, the, I mean, if a, we can a Danish stick... delegation of MPs was banned earlier this but, week. But, but again, Nauru doesn't dictate, nor does any other country dictate to me, who I issue visas to to come to this country. And Similarly in Nauru and PNG or New Zealand or elsewhere, the Australian government doesn't issue visas for people to travel. Now, uh, there are more people than just the two that you point out from the media who have been up to Nauru uh, over the years. And well, I've, it is... I've been there myself when Australia's government helped us to go to film the camp as it was then and, and being it's established. Issue... But since your government's been in, I think two media organisations have been in in those three years. It's, it's not much and that's not for want of trying. But, but it, this is a question, this is a question NGOs. with respect. I mean, this is a question for the Nauru government because, as I say, I, I'm not dictated to in terms of who, uh, as the Australian Immigration Minister, I issue visas but to. But it's not, it's, you are, it's a client state. $1.2 billion has been spent on those two centres in those two countries. You're not seriously telling me that Australia, if Australia's government asked Nauru to, to open up their centres more, Nauru wouldn't listen. The, the issue is for Nauru. I want to come back to another point that you just made uh, a second ago, and that was in relation to uh, the international scrutiny, if you like, or uh, organisations like uh, the United Nations or Red Cross uh, who visit regularly to uh, Nauru. I think that's important to point out as well. As I say, there, there is a lot of... There is a lot of hype uh, and a lot of misinformation out there because but ultimately what people want to do uh, is undermine the process that we've got because they don't believe in a strong border protection policy. Now there are two ways to approach this in the modern age. One we're seeing uh, as it operates in Europe and other parts of the world at the moment, which is a failed process. In Australia we have been able to secure our borders. We're an island nation so we have an advantage over landlocked countries. We do at the same time as we have a tough policy in keeping our borders secure, stopping kids drowning at sea and getting people out of detention, we are able to bring people in in a record number and I think that needs to be recognised and, and surely acknowledged by somebody as objective as you. Nauru, as you say, is, is a sovereign country. If, as a sovereign country, it decided to accept New Zealand's offer of resettling some of the refugees in New Zealand, would you be happy with that? Well, that's an issue between Nauru and is New it? Zealand. So you would have no objection no, if but, a deal were done between those no, two countries? No, but let, let me make this very important qualification, because we have had uh, people smugglers that have tried to send boats across the top of Australia to New Zealand before. Uh, let me make this very important point, uh, that people, if they've sought to come by boat, it doesn't matter where they're settled, in whatever third country, New Zealand or somewhere else, they will not be coming to Australia at any point. And we've been very clear about that, because I'm not going to give up the gains that we've made We've stopped the drownings at sea. We've brought record numbers of refugees in. We provide better settlement opportunities than almost any other country in the world. Uh, and we are not going to allow the people smugglers in our region to get back in control of the situation and see men, women and children go to the bottom of the ocean. So I'm not going to allow people to subvert the success of the program uh, because I do want to settle people uh, who are in need. So people in camps in Jordan, uh, in Lebanon, for example, are being displaced for, by people who and hop on a plane and go to somewhere like Jakarta, uh, economic refugees, and would seek to displace somebody who is a legitimate humanitarian refugee. And the 2,000 people who are refugee. being held in what some have called Australia's Guantanamo Bay, they are a human shield, they are the price you have to pay for these policies, are they? Is it just tough luck on them that they've ended up there and having to languish there? No, term? again, and, and I think, uh, frankly, you, you uh, deliberately or otherwise attempt to tarnish the reputation of Australia when it's unwarranted. We the, these aren't my words. Guantanamo, Australia's Guantanamo Bay is something but that if a respected repeat, human if rights lawyer repeat, has said well, and, and, and a paediatrician who worked on Nauru as well. But again, Both. Andrew, with respect, if you're going to repeat those sort of emotive claims, I, I'd ask you to back them up. I mean, on what basis do you, do you make that claim? That this is effectively a holding centre for people who are pretty much controlled, their fates are controlled by Australia, and yet they are in another country where Australia has power but not 
not responsibility. But how does, how does this equate to uh, the images that you're trying to conjure up in people's minds of Guantanamo Bay? I mean, I think it is an outrageous suggestion, to be perfectly frank. And I, I'd, I'd ask people to look at the facts as opposed to uh, the emotion and some of the misinformation. Minister, a final question. Where does this end? No one has been transferred to either Nauru or Papua New Guinea since 2014, but they are still stuck there. When do those prisons, those refugee camps, those regional processing centres, whatever the language, when do they close? You've said that the Man Asylum one will close, but until you say when and how, that doesn't mean very much. Well, let, let me be very clear. We're keen to work with people to send them back to their country of origin or to help them settle uh, in a third country, and we're in discussion with third countries now. But uh, this, this will, well, I'm not going to go into uh, bilateral discussions or multilateral discussions that we're having, but uh, the, the, the point is very clear that we are not going to allow people smugglers to get back into business. So the point very validly that you make is, you know, how does this finish? It, it doesn't finish. In fact, it recommences as a problem if we allow new arrivals. And we'll continue to work with our global partners uh, in an effort to provide significant aid, as Australia does, to provide a record number of places under the Refugee and Humanitarian Program. But we'll do it in an orderly way. That way people don't die and we don't displace those people who are most in need. Minister, thanks very much for talking thanks, to Al Jazeera. My pleasure, thank you. Thanks so much.